The Preface This book belongs to the most rare of men. Perhaps none of them is yet alive. It is possible that they may be among those who understand my Zarathustra. Some men are born posthumously, even to endure my seriousness, my passion. He must carry intellectual integrity to the verge of hardness. He must be accustomed to living on mountain tops and to looking upon the wretched gabble of politics and nationalism as beneath him. He must have become indifferent. He must never ask of the truth whether it brings profit to him or fatality to him. He must have an inclination, born of strength, for questions that no one has the courage for. The courage for the forbidden, predestination for the labyrinth. New ears for new music, new eyes for what is most distant, a new conscience for truth that have yet remained unheard, reverence for self, love of self, absolute freedom of self. Oh, that sort only are my readers, my true readers, my readers foreordained, the rest are merely humanity. And one must make oneself superior to humanity, in power, in loftiness of soul, and in contempt. Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche Let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. We know all well enough how remote our place is. Neither by land nor by water will you find the road to the Hyperboreans. Even Pindar in his day knew that much about us. Beyond the north, beyond the ice, beyond death, our life, our happiness. We have discovered that happiness. We know the way. We got our knowledge of it from a thousand years of, in the labyrinth. Who else has found it? The man of today? I am whatever doesn't know either the way out nor the way in. So sigh the man of today. This is the sort of modernity that made us ill. We sickened on lazy peace, cowardly promises, the whole virtuous dirtiness of the modern yea and nay. What is good? Whatever arguments that feeling of power, the will to power, power itself in man, what is evil? Whatever springs from weakness? And what is happiness? The feeling that power increases? That resistance is overcome? Not contentment, but more power. Not peace at any price, but war. Not virtue, but efficacy. The weak and the botch shall perish. First principle of our charity and one should help them to it. What is more harmful than any vice? Practical sympathy for the botched and the weak. This is Christianity. The problem that is set here is not what shall replace mankind in order of living creatures, but what type of man must be bred, must be willed, as being the most valuable of the worthy of life, the most secure guaranteed of the future. This more valuable type has appeared often enough in the past, but always as a happy accident, as an exception never deliberately willed. Very often it has been precisely the most feared, and out of that terror, the contrary type has been willed, cultivated and attained. The domestic animal, the herd animal, the sick brute man, the Christian. Man can surely does not represent an evolution towards a better or stronger or higher level, as progress is now understood. This progress is merely a modern idea, which is to say a false idea. 
the European of today, in his essential worth, falls far below the European of the Renaissance. The process of evolution does not necessarily mean elevation, enhancement, strengthening. We should not deck out and embellish Christianity. It has waged a war to the death against this higher type of man. It has put all the deepest instincts of this type under its ban. It has developed its concepts of evil, of the evil one himself, the strong man as the typical reprobate, the outcast among men. Christianity has taken the part of all the weak, the low, the botched. It has made an ideal out of antagonism to all the self-preservative instincts of sound life. It has corrupted even the faculties of those intellectually most vigorous by representing the highest intellectual values as sinful, as misleading, as full of temptation. I call an animal, a species, an individual corrupt when it loses its instincts, when it chooses and prefers what is injurious. Life itself appears to me as an instinct for growth, for survival, for the accumulation of forces, for power. Whenever the will to power fails, There is disaster. My contention is that all the highest values of humanity have been emptied of this will to power. That the value of decadence, of nihilism now prevail under the holiest names. Christianity is called the religion of pity. Pity stands in opposition to all the tonic passions that augments the energy of the feeling of aliveness, it is a depressant. A man loses power when he pities, through pity that drain upon strength which sufferings works is multiplied a thousandfold. Suffering is made contagious by pity. Under certain circumstances it may lead to a total sacrifice of life and living energy. Pity prevents the whole law of evolution, which is the law of natural selection. Mankind has ventured to call pity a virtue. Nothing is more unhealthy than Christian pity. To be the doctors here, to be the unmerciful here, to wield to the knife here, all that is our business, all this is our sort of humanity. By this sign, we are philosophers, we Hyperboreans. It is necessary to say just whom we regard as our antagonists, theologians, and all who have any theological blood in their veins. This poisoning goes a great deal further than most people think. I find the arrogant habit of the theologians among all who regard themselves as idealists, among all who by virtue of higher point of departure claim a right to rise above reality and to look upon it with suspicion. The pure soul is a pure lie. So long as the priest, the professional denier, calumniator and poisoner of life is accepted as a higher variety of man. There can be no answer to the question, what is truth? Truth has already been stood on its head when the obvious attorney of mere emptiness is mistaken for its representative. Upon this theological instinct I make war. Whoever has theological blood in his veins is shifty and dishonorable in all things. And the pathetic thing that grows out of this condition is called faith. In other words, 
closing one's eyes upon oneself once and for all to avoid suffering is the sigh of incurable falsehood. People erect a concept of morality, of virtue, of holiness upon this false view. It is the most widespread and the most subterranean form of falsehood to be found on earth. And whatever a theologian regards as true must be false. There you have almost a criteria of truth. So wherever the influence of theologians is felt, there is transvolution of values, and the concept true and false are forced to change places. Among Germans, I am immediately understood when I say that theological blood is the ruin of philosophy. What destroys a man more quickly than to work, think and feel without inner necessity, without any deep personal desire, without pleasure as a mere autonomation of duty? This is the recipe of decadence and no less for idiocy. When a man feels that he has a divine mission, say to lift up or to save or to liberate mankind, when a man feels this divine spark in his heart and believes that he is the mouthpiece of his supernatural imperatives, when such a mission inflames him, it is only natural that he should stand beyond all merely responsible standards of judgment, right? He feels that he is himself sanctified by this mission and that he is himself of a higher order. What has a priest to do with philosophy? He stands far above it and hither the priest has ruled. He has determined the meaning of true and not true. Let us not underestimate the fact that we ourselves, we free spirits, are already a transvolution of all values, a visualized declaration of war and victory against all the old concepts of true and not true. We have had the whole pathetic stupidity of mankind against us. Our objectives, our methods, our quiet, cautious, distrustful manner, all appear to them as absolutely discreditable and contemptible. It was our modesty that stood our longest against their taste. How well they guessed that, these turkey cocks of God. We have unlearned something. We have become more modest in every way. We no longer derive man from the spirit or from the Godhead. We have dropped him back among the beasts. We regard him as the strongest of the beasts because he is the craftiest, one of the results of thereof is his intellectuality. He is, in truth, anything but the crown of creation. Beside him stands many other animals all at similar stages of development. For man, relatively speaking, is the most botched of all the animals and the sickliest, and he has wandered the most dangerously from his instincts, though for all that, to be sure, he remains the most interesting. The pure spirit is a piece of pure stupidity, Take away the nervous system and the senses, the so-called mortal shell, and the rest is miscalculation. That's all. Under Christianity, neither morality nor religion has any point of contact with actuality. It offers purely imaginary causes. Between God and soul and ego and spirit and sin, salvation, grace, punishment, forgiveness of sins. 
just imaginary beings between God and spirits and souls and anthropocentric. It's a total denial of the concept of natural causes. Also an imaginary psychology like repentance, pangs of conscience and temptation by the devil, the presence of God, and as well as an imaginary theology, kingdom of God, the last judgment, eternal life. Once the concept of nature has been opposed to the concept of God, the word natural necessarily took on the meaning of abominable. The whole of that fictitious world has its sources in hatred of the natural and is no more the evidence of a profound uneasiness in the presence of reality. This explains everything. Who alone has any reason for living his way out of reality? The preponderance of pains and pleasures in the course of this fictitious morality and religion But such a preponderance also supplies the formula for decadence. A criticism of the Christian concept of God leads inevitably to the same conclusion. A nation that still believes in itself holds fast to its own God. A man is grateful for his own existence. To that end he needs a God. Such a God must be able to work both benefits and injuries. He must be able to play either friend or foe. He is wondered at for the good he does as well as for the evil he does. But the castration against all nature of such a God, making him a God of goodness alone, would be contrary to human inclination. And mankind has just as much need for an evil God as for a good God. What would be the value of a God who knew nothing about anger, revenge, envy, scorn, cunning, violence? No one would understand such a God. Why should anyone want him? Formally, he represented a people, the strength of a people. Everything aggressive and thirsty for power in the soul of the people. Now, he is simply the good God. The truth is that there is no other alternative for gods. Either they are the will to power, in which case they are national gods, or incapacity for power, in which case they have to be good gods. Whenever the will to power begins to decline, in whatever form, There is always an accompanying decline psychologically, a decadence. And the divinity of this decadence, scorn of its masculine virtues and passions, is converted perforce into a god of the psychologically degraded of the weak. Of course, they do not call themselves the weak. They call themselves the good, the good god. And the devil, like him, both are abortions of decadence. So how can we be so tolerant of the naivety of Christian theologians as to join in their doctrines? When everything necessary to ascending life, when all that is strong, courageous, masterful and proud has been eliminated from the concept of a god, when he has sunk step by step to the level of a staff for the weary, a sheet anchor for the drowning, when he becomes the poor man's God, the sinner's God, the invalid's God par excellence, and the attribute of Savior or Redeemer remains as the essential attribute of divinity. Just what is the significance of such metamorphosis? What does such a reduction of the Godhead imply? The Christian concept of a God, a God as the patron of the sick, the God as a spinner of cobwebs, the God as a spirit, 
is one of the most corrupt concepts that has ever been set up in this world. It probably touches low watermarks in the ebbing evolution of the God type. God generated into the contradiction of life? In him war is declared on life, on nature, on the will to live. God becomes the formula for every slander upon the here and now and for every lie about the beyond. In him nothingness is defiled and the will to nothingness is made holy. The fact that the strong races of Northern Europe did not repudiate this Christian God does little credit to their gift for religion and not much more to their taste. A curse lies upon them because they were not equal to it. Two thousand years have come and gone and not a single new God. Instead, there still exists this pitiful God of Christian monotonotheism. This hybrid image of decay conjured up out of emptiness, contradiction and vain imagining in which all the instinct of decadence, all the cowardness and weariness of the soul find their sanction. Buddhism is a hundred times as realistic as Christianity. It is part of its living heritage. It's it is able to face problems objectively and coolly. It is a product of long centuries of philosophical speculations. It does not speak of a struggle with sin, but yielding to reality of the struggle with suffering. Sharply differentiating itself from Christianity, it puts the self-deception that lies in moral concepts behind it. The one thing needful the question, how can you be delivered from suffering, regulates and determines the whole spiritual diet. Buddhism is not a religion in which perfection is merely an object of aspiration. Perfection is actually normal. Christian is all hatred of the intellect, of pride, of courage, of freedom, of intellectual libertinage. Christian is all hatred of the senses, of joy in the senses, of joy in general. Buddhism, I repeat, is a hundred times more austere, more honest and more objective. It no longer has to justify its pains, its susceptibility to suffering by interpreting these things in terms of sin. It simply says and it simply thinks I suffer. I barely touch upon the problem of the origin of Christianity. The first thing necessary to its solution is this, that Christianity is to be understood only by examining the soil from which it sprung. It is not a reaction against Jewish instincts. It is their inevitable product. It is simply one more step in the awe-aspiring logic of the Jews. In the words of the Savior, salvation is of the Jews. In my genealogy of morals, I give the first psychological explanation of the concepts underlying those two antithetical things, a noble morality and a ressentiment morality. The Judeo-Christian moral system belongs to the second division and in every detail. And to the sort of men who reach out for power under Judaism and Christianity, that is to say the priestly class, decadence is no more than a means to an end. And men of this sort have a vital interest in making mankind sick and in confusing the values of good and bad true and false, in a matter that is not only dangerous to life, but also slanders it. Christianity sprang from a soil so corrupt that on it everything natural 
everything of natural value and every reality was opposed by the deepest instinct of the ruling class and it grew up as a sort of a war to death upon reality and as such it has never been surpassed. Our age is proud of its historical sense. How then could it delude itself into believing that the crude fable and of the wonder worker and savior constituted the beginnings of Christianity and that everything spiritual and symbolical in it is only came later quite the contrary the whole history of Christianity from the death on the cross onward is the history of a progressively clumsier misunderstanding of an original symbolism I cannot at this place avoid a sigh. There are days when I am visited by a feeling blacker than the blackest melancholy, contempt of man. Let me leave no doubt as to what I despise and whom I despise. It is the man of today, the man with whom I am unhappy, contemporaneous. I am suffocated by his foul breath. And I pass through whole millenniums of this madhouse of a world. Call it Christianity, Christian faith, or the Christian church, as you will. I take care not to hold mankind responsible for its lunacies. But my feeling changes and it breaks out in irrestability the moment I enter modern times, our times. What was formerly merely sick now becomes indecent. It is indecent to be Christian today. And here my disgust begins. I look about me. Not a word survives of what once was called truth. We can no longer bear to hear a priest pronounce the word. Even a man who makes the most modest pretensions to integrity must know that A theologian, a priest, a pope of today, when he speaks, he actually lies, and that he no longer escapes the blames for his lie through innocence or ignorance. The priest knows, as everyone knows, that there is no longer any God or any sinner or any savior, that free will and the moral order of the world are lies. All the ideas of the church are now recognized for what they are as the worst counterfeits in existence invented to debase nature and all natural values. The priest himself is seen as he actually is, as the most dangerous form of parasite, as the venomous spider of creation. We know, and our conscience now knows, that just what the real value of all those sinister intentions of priest and church has been what the ends they have served, with their debasement of humanity to a state of self-pollution. The concepts, the other world, the last judgment, the immortality of the soul, the soul itself, They are all merely instruments of torture, systems of cruelty, whereby the priest becomes master and remains master. Everyone knows this, but nevertheless things remain as before. What has become of the last trace of decent feeling, of self-respect when our statement, otherwise an unconventional class of man and thoroughly anti-Christian in their acts, now call themselves Christians and go to the communion table? Whom then does Christianity deny? What does it call the world? To be a soldier, to be a judge, to be a patriot, to defend oneself, to be careful of one's honor, to desire one's own advantage, to be proud. Every act of every day, every instinct, every value, Evaluation that shows itself in a deed is now anti-Christian. What a monster of falsehood. 
the modern man must be to call himself, nevertheless and without shame, a Christian. I shall go back a bit and tell you the authentic history of Christianity. The very word Christianity is a misunderstanding. At bottom, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. The Gospels died on the cross. It is an error amounting to nonsensicality to see in faith, and particularly in faith in salvation through Christ, only the Christian way of life, the life lived by him who died on the cross, is Christian. In fact, there are no Christians. The Christian, he who for 2,000 years has passed as a Christian, is simply a psychological self-delusion. And closely examined, it appears that, despite all his faith, he has been ruled only by his instincts. In all ages, for example, in the case of Luther, faith has been no more than a cloak, a pretense, a curtain, behind which the instincts have played their game. People always talk of their faith and act according to their instincts. In the world of ideas of the Christian, there is nothing that so much as touches reality. On the contrary, one recognizes an instinctive hatred of reality. Who put him to death? Who was his natural enemy? The question flashed like a lightning stroke. And the answer is the ruling class, Judaism. And from that moment, one found oneself in revolt against the established order and began to understand Jesus as in revolt against the established order. Obviously, the little community had not understood what was precisely the most important thing of all. The example offered by his, this way of dying, the freedom from and superiority to every feeling of resentment, a plan, indication of how little he was understand he was understood at all all that jesus could hope to accomplish by his death in itself was to offer the strongest possible proof or example of his teachings in the most public manner and from that time onward an absurd problem offered itself God gave his son as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. At once there was an end of the Gospels. A sacrifice for sin and in its most obnoxious and barbarous form. Sacrifice of the innocent for the sins of the guilty. What appalling paganism. Jesus himself had done away with the very concept of guilt. And from this time forward the type of the Savior was corrupted bit by bit by the doctrine of judgment on, of, and of the second coming, the doctrine of death as a sacrifice, the doctrine of the resurrection, the entire concept of blessedness in favor of the state of existence after death. St. Paul with that rabbinical impudence gave a logical quality to that indecent conception. And he said, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then all our faith is in vain. And at once there sprang from the Gospels the most contemptible of all unfulfillable promises, the shameless doctrine of personal immortality. Paul even preached it as a reward. One now begins to see what it was that came to an end with the death on the cross. A new and thoroughly original effort to found a Buddhistic peace movement and to establish happiness on earth. For this remains 
As I have already pointed out, the essential differences between the two religions of decadence is that Buddhism promises nothing but actually fulfills and Christianity promises everything but fulfills nothing. In Paul is incarnated the very opposite of the bearer of glad tidings. He represents the genius for hatred, the vision of hatred, the relentless logic of hatred. Above all, the Savior, he nailed him to his own cross. The life, the example, the teaching, the death of Christ, the meaning and the law of the whole Gospels. Nothing was left of all this after that counterfeit in hatred had reduced it to his uses. Once more, the priestly instinct of the Jew perpetrated the same old master crime against history. He simply struck out the yesterday and the day before yesterday of Christianity and invented his own history of Christian beginnings. To see anything honest in such a man as Paul, whose home was at the center of the Stoic Enlightenment, when he converts an hallucination into a proof of the resurrection of the Savior, in Paul the priest once more reached out for power. He had use only for such concepts, teachings and symbols as served the purpose of tyrannizing over the masses and organizing mobs. What was the only part of Christianity that Muhammad borrowed later on? Paul's invention, his device for establishing priestly tyranny and organizing the mob namely the belief in the immortality of the soul, that is to say, the doctrine of judgment. When the center of gravity of life is placed, not in life itself, but in the beyond, in nothingness, then one has taken away its center of gravity altogether. And the vast lie of personal immortality destroys all reason, all natural instinct. Henceforth, everything in in the instinct that is beneficial, that fosters life and that safeguards the future, is a cause of suspicion. Why take any pride in decent and forefathers? Why labor together? and trust one another or concern oneself about the common welfare and try to serve it. One thing only is necessary, that every man, because he has an immortal soul, is as good as every other man. That is an infinite universe of things the salvation of every individual may lay claim to eternal importance The salvation of the soul, in plain English, means the world revolves around me. And the poisonous doctrines, equal rights for all, has been propagated as a Christian principle out of the secret nooks and crannies of bad instinct. Christianity has waged a deadly war upon all feelings of reverence and distance between man and man which is to say upon the first prerequisite to every step upward, to every development of civilization, out of the resentment of the masses. It has forged its chief chief weapons against us, against everything that is noble, joyous and high-spirited on earth, against our happiness on earth. The aristocratic attitude of mind has been undermined by the lie of the equality of souls and the belief in the privilege of majority makes and will continue to make revolutions. It is Christianity, 
let us not doubt, Christian valuations which convert every revolution into a carnal of blood and crime. Christianity is a revolt of all creatures that creep on the ground against everything that is lofty, the gospel of the lowly. Here we are among Jews. This is the first thing to be borne in mind if we are not to lose the thread of the matter. The positive genius for conjuring up a delusion of personal holiness unmatched anywhere else, either in the books or by men. This elevation of fraud in word and attitude to the level of an art, all this is not an accident due to the chance talent of an individual or to any violation of nature. The thing responsible is race. The Christian, that ultima radio of lying, is the Jew all over again. He is threefold the Jew. The whole of mankind, even the best minds of the best ages, with one exception perhaps hardly human, have permitted themselves to be deceived. Let us not be led astray. They say, judge not. And yet they condemn to hell whoever stands in their way. In letting God sit in judgment, they judge themselves. In glorifying God, they glorify themselves. In demanding that everyone shows the virtues which they themselves happen not, happen not to be capable of, in point of fact, they simply do what they cannot help doing. Forced, like hypocrites, to the sneaky, to hide in corner, to slink along in the shadows, they convert their necessity into a duty. Ah, that humble, chaste, charitable brand of fraud. One may read the Gospels as books of moral seduction. These petty folk fasten themselves to morality. Morality is the best of all devices for leading mankind by the nose. We observe the most fatal sort of megalomania that the earth has ever seen. Little abortions of bigots and liars began to claim exclusive rights in the concepts of God, the truth, the light, the spirit, love, wisdom and life, as if, they're, as if these things were symptoms of themselves and thereby they sought to fence themselves off from the world. The Christian is simply a Jew of the Reformed Confession. The thing that sets us apart is not that we are unable to find God, either in history or in nature or behind nature, but that we regard what has been honored as God, not as divine, but as God as pitiable, as absurd, as injurious, not as a mere error, but a crime against life. We deny that their God is God. And if anyone were to show us this Christian God, we'd be still less inclined to believe in him. Such a religion as Christianity, which does not touch reality at a single point, and which goes to pieces the moment reality asserts its right, must be inevitably the deadly enemy of the wisdom of this world. Paul knew that faith was necessary. The God that Paul invented for himself, the wisdom of this world, is reduced to absurdity. It is in truth only an indication of Paul's resolute determination to accomplish that very thing himself. To give one's own will the name of God. Torah, that is essentially Jewish. That is to say, as a philologian, a man sees behind the holy books 
and as a physician he sees behind the physiological degeneration of the typical Christian. The physician says incurable, the philologian says fraud. The old God, Holy Spirit, Holy Perfect, is promenading in his garden and he's bored and trying to kill time. Against boredom even God struggle in vain. He creates man. Man is entertaining. But then he noticed that man is also bored. So he creates other animals. This is God's first mistake. To man these other animals were not entertaining. He sought dominion over them. He did not want to be an animal himself. So God created woman. In this act he brought boredom to an end. But woman was the second mistake of God. Because woman, she is the serpent Heva. Every priest knows that. From woman comes every evil in the world. Every priest knows that too. She is to blame for science. It was through woman that man learned to taste of the tree of knowledge. And the old God was seized by mortal terror. Man himself has been his greatest blunder. He had created a rival to himself. Science makes men godlike. It is all up with priests and gods when men become scientific. Science is the first of sins, the germ of all sins, the original sin. Thou shalt not know. The rest follows from that. God's mortal terror, however, did not hinder him from being thrued. How is one to protect oneself against science? Thoughts that man must not think. And so the priest invent distress, death, the mortal danger of childbirth, all sorts of misery, old age, above all sickness, nothing but devices for making war on science. And the old god invent, invents war. He separates the people. He makes them destroy one another. Knowledge, deliverance from the priest, prospers in spite of war. So the old god comes to this his final resolution. Man has become scientific. There is no help for it. He must be drowned. When the natural consequences of an act are no longer natural, but are regarded as produced by the ghostly creation of superstition, in other words, by God, by spirits, by souls, and reckoned as merely moral consequences, as rewards, as punishments, as hints, as lessons. Then the whole groundwork of knowledge is destroyed. Then the greatest of crimes against humanity has been perpetrated. I repeat that sin, man's self-desecration par excellence, was invented in order to make science, culture, and every elevation of man impossible. The priest rules through the invention of sin. Christianity finds sickness necessary, and the actual ulterior purpose of the whole system of salvation of the Church is to make people ill. The whole earth is a madhouse, and the sort of religious man that the church wants is a typical decadent. The majority became the master. Democracy, with its Christian instinct, triumphed. Christianity was not national. It was not based on race. It appealed to all the varieties of men, and had its allies everywhere. One is not converted to Christianity. One must first be sick enough for it. Everything that suffers, everything that hangs on the cross, is divine. We all hang on the cross. Consequently, we are divine. 
We alone are divine. Christianity was thus a victory. A nobler attitude of mind was destroyed. By it, Christianity remains to this day the greatest misfortune of humanity. Christianity stands in opposition to all intellectual well-being. Sick reasoning is the only sort that it can use as Christian reasoning. It takes the side of everything that is idiotic. It pronounces a curse upon the intellect, upon the superbia of the healthy intellect. And the pietist and the priest is a fraud because he is sick. The instinct demands that the truth shall never be allowed its right on any point. And the impulse to lie, it is by this that I recognize every foreordained theologian. Another characteristic of the theologian is that he is unfit for philology. They made signs in blood along the way that they went, and their folly taught them that the truth is proved by blood. But blood is the worst of all testimonies to the truth. Blood poisoneth even the purest teaching, and it turneth into madness and hatred in heart. Do not let yourself be deceived. Great intellects are skeptical. The strength, the freedom which proceed from intellectual power, from a superabundance of intellectual power, manifest themselves as skepticism. And men of convictions are prisoners. Freedom from any sort of conviction belongs to strength and to an independent point of view. The man of faith, the believer of any sort, is necessarily a dependent man. Such a man cannot posit himself as a goal, nor can he find goals within himself. The believer does not belong to himself. He can only be a means to an end. Every sort of faith is in itself an evidence of self-estrangement. Slavery is the one and only condition which makes for the well-being of the weak willed man. The most intelligent men, like the strongest, find their happiness where other would find only disaster. In the labyrinth, in being hard with themselves and with others, in effort, the delight is in self-mastery. In them, asceticism becomes second nature, as it's necessary, it's an instinct. There is a perfect likeness between Christian and Antichrist. Their object, their instinct, points only towards destruction. One need only to turn to history for a proof of this. There it appears with appalling distinctness. The Christian and the Antichrist both are decadents. Both are incapable of any act that is not disintegrating, poisonous, degenerating, blood-sucking. Both have an instinct of mortal hatred of everything that stands up and is great and has durability and promises life a future. Christianity was the vampire of the Imperium Romanum. Overnight it destroyed the vast achievement of the Romans, the conquest of the soil for a great culture that could await its time. Can it be that this fact is not yet understood? The German nobility, which is fundamentally a Viking nobility, was in its elements there. The Church knew only too well how the German nobility was to be won. The German noble, always the Swiss guard of the Church, always in the service of every bad instincts of the Church, but well paid. Consider the fact that it is precisely the aid of German swords and German blood and valor 
that has enabled the church to carry through its wars to death upon everything noble on earth? At this point a host of painful questions suggest themselves. The German nobility stands outside the history of the highest civilization. And the reason is obvious. Christianity, alcohol, the two great means of corruption. I can't make out how a German could even feel Christian. With this, I come to a conclusion and pronounce my judgment. I condemn Christianity. I bring against the Christian church the most terrible of all the accusations that an accuser has ever had in his mouth. It is, to me, the greatest of all imaginable corruptions. It seeks to work the ultimate corruption, the worst possible corruption. The Christian Church has left nothing untouched by its depravity. It has turned every value into worthlessness, and every truth into a lie, and every integrity into baseness of soul. Let anyone dare to speak to me of its humanitarian blessings, its deepest necessities range it against any effort to abolish distress. It lives by distress, it creates distress to make itself immortal. For example, the worm of sin. It was the church that first enriched mankind with this misery. The equality of souls before God, this fraud, this pretext for the rancunes of all the based-minded, this explosive concept ending in revolution. The modern idea and the notion of overthrowing the whole social order? This is Christian dynamite. To breed out of humanitas a self-contradiction, an art of self-pollution, a will to lie at any price, an aversion and contempt for all good and honest instincts? All this to me is the humanitarianism of Christianity. Parasitism as the only practice of the church, with its anemic and holy ideas sucking all the blood, all the love, all the hope out of life, the beyond as the will to deny all reality, the cross as a distinguished mark of the most subterranean conspiracies ever heard of, against health, against beauty, well-being, intellect, kindness of soul, against life itself. I call Christianity the one great curse, the one great intrinsic depravity, the one great instinct of revenge, for which no means are venomous enough or secret, subterranean and small enough. I call it the one immortal blemish upon the human race.